right, welcome to this episode of the Scott Verplank Show. I got one of my favorite people in the world, Doug Ferguson. He's the lead writer, sports writer, covering golf for the Associated Press. So he has been around, he's seen it all. Um, fantastic guy. You actually went to OU mm. um, for start. journalism school, which is relevant around here. So when, when were you at OU? I was at OU from 84 to 87. So, so journalism school was a whole four-year commitment. Was it the Gaylord School of Journalism back then? It wasn't. And it was really, I mean, if I was being honest, which uh, you'd probably prefer me to be, um, I was buying time. I mean, I was, I was young and stupid and trying to figure out what you should be doing with life. I had a, I had a uh, bachelor's degree from Spanish. Please don't ask any more questions. Uh, from Abilene Christian, went to OU to do to do graduate school in, in journalism and became one of those statistics where you do everything but the thesis. Because at that point, I'd gotten a job with the AP, I'd gotten married, oh, I'll finish it later. And you know how the rest of it turns out. But, well, so. yeah, so they had to put somebody to do golf, so there you are. They but did. I was going to ask you, how in the world did you end up at Abilene Christian University studying Spanish? I mean, could you could you do this interview in Spanish? No, that's Spanish for no, by the way. Okay, <laughs> see, yeah, um, no, a little long time ago. I just look. I was I was, um, you know, growing up in California. I I, uh, I was in a program I didn't uh, know about until years later, in which I skipped the first grade. They were trying to see what would happen if you took a first grader and just put him into the second grade, which nothing because you don't learn anything at that age anyway. But um, but uh, long story short, I was very, very young, and I went to Abilene. My brother and two sisters were there. We grew up in the Church of Christ, and um, Spanish was what I was good at, so I figured you're supposed to do, you know, you're supposed to study what you're good at, and then I realized later that the only thing you do with the Spanish degree is teach, and I hated school in the first place, so we got a problem. <laughs> well, I decided, decided uh... to do a, a double in PR, and the first thing is news writing, and that came naturally, and then off we go. Well, uh, that you know, I, I've known Later. you a long time, but I did not know that you uh, studied Spanish in college. You know, and being well, from surprises, yep, that surprises. The, that's kind of like muchas gracias, señores, <laughs> uh, and uno más cerveza. The only things I really know. <laughs> um, por favor. Um, yeah, because I thought that was kind of strange that you grew up in SoCal, San Diego area, I think, and yep. and ended up in Abilene, Texas. That had to be a little bit of a, a culture Sorry. shock to you jarring to be able to see California from Abilene because it's so flat. Right. Well, yeah, you can see it from there. <laughs> That's uh, interesting. But then you went to OU. So I, you still, Doug has been, uh, when you're not wearing a Hawaiian shirt, and for people that are watching this, and if you've ever watched golf, you've seen, they're showing the last group, Tiger Woods, Phil Mickelson, whoever. And you, there's some guy in shorts and a Hawaiian shirt in the background. That is my man, Doug Ferguson, because he is he has watched more golf than probably anybody. And he's walked with the best players in the world more than anybody. Um, and consequently, because of that, Doug, you're one of the few guys left, really, who kind of has the trust in the in the um, the ability to talk to um, kind of like you said with the media. You know, guys are wanting, wanting their little quick hit and they're, you know, and they're first one to say, oh, yeah, Tiger Woods said this. And you've been out there and, and walked so many miles and have been there and asked great questions and don't, you know, from what I can tell you, you don't really ever throw anybody under the bus. You just kind of tell the story as it happens. Um, so you've earned a, you're one of the last guys that I know of that is that earns the trust and respect from the guys that play. So. To me, that might be your greatest accomplishment because there hasn't, there's not hardly any of those guys left, but there really haven't been that many along the way either. So, um, obviously, you did that on purpose, but was it just being there and 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 not not interjecting yourself into it and taking in all you can, or what's the secret to do that? You know, um, I think you hit on something earlier in terms of being able. You know, they give us these little badges that let us walk inside the ropes. And I've never understood why you'd want to sit in a press center and watch it on, on TV when you could be out there watching. You know, I always remember the story you told about Tiger at the Memorial hitting a, a th three iron straight up in the air and landing it softly. That's the stuff you get to see. So it's really just a matter of 
of having an opportunity to go watch them up hand. Um, and you just, you just see stuff that you don't always see on TV. Oddly enough, you see stuff on TV you could never see in, in person, you know, in terms of how quick the yeah. camera can get. And I, and I get that. Um, probably my biggest regret, it's not a regret. It's just the way life is, is because of the AP and because of our deadlines, I never get to see the finish. I mean, I have to, we <laughs> have to file probably within five minutes. So physically you cannot get from, you know, 18th green back into the press. Saying, you know, I have to, I have to watch on on TV the last probably hour or so. And it just breaks my heart to hear some of the, some of the boys today come in and, and I'm hearing them talk about what they saw and how loud it was and what this was going on. And I'm sitting in front of a TV and that is a, <laughs> that is a big regret, but that's just the way it is. Yeah. Well, you know, I never really thought about that. I, I never uh, thought that you weren't there to the very end. Um, one time. It seems, well, it seems like you're everywhere. So one, one time I would tell you that, Scott, we were in, in Valderrama. I think it was the second is the first Amex uh, that they had back in, in 99. Tiger gets into a playoff with Jimenez. And because of a six hour time difference, I thought, finally, I can I can go ahead and, and be out there and, and watch to the end. And I'll never forget the entire armed Spanish civil guard lining the fairway. And one of them bumped my buddy Lynn Shapiro from the Washington Post. Lynn yeah. doesn't like to be touched. And as soon as someone bumped him, he started getting into him. And I'm like, Lynn, they're armed. Just <laughs> let it go. Let it go. Yeah, well, it's a damn good thing you know how to speak Spanish, yeah, though. Right. So you probably you probably talked your way out of the situation, yeah, correct? Yeah. Well, let's see. That degree came in handy. You saved yeah. Lynn's life. There was another one, too. I don't mind telling you. It was at Bay Hill when Tiger and Phil were going at it. Great theater. And I was with Phil. Tiger was about two holes behind. And I'm with Mark Rolfing. And this is a, this is a lesson in, in the AP and all the stuff we have to do. I thought, you know what? I can stay out here the entire back nine. I can hear the cheers for Tiger. Rolfing can fill me in. I'm watching Phil. And about the 10th hole, Rolfing says, Ah, oh, Paul Runyon died. What a shame. And I'm thinking, do we have an obit ready on Paul Runyon? Probably not. And so as Phil is on the 16th, and I don't know if you remember that tournament, he's trying to hit this shot out of the rough, under a tree, over the water, onto the green, failed miserably. Uh, and I'm on the phone with Paul Runyon's son, with him saying, not only was he a great player and a great teacher, he was a good dad. And <laughs> that's where I spent the rest of the Bay Hill was writing Paul Runyon's obituary. Same guy, Lynn Shapiro, comes up to me at the end of the day, taps me on the shoulder. He said, do a good job with that. We're using three paragraphs. There you go. Life at the AP. <laughs> well, there you go. Um, hey, been doing it a long time, so I know you've seen all kinds of stuff. All right. So a little bit different, not away from the media, but you live in Jacksonville, which is where the PGA Tour is the home base. So obviously you're kind of at the epicenter of what's going on, at least as far as the tour goes. Mm -hmm. So how's your relationship with the tour or how would you describe it is, since you're right there? Do you have a good relationship getting the stuff you need to report or do they try to filter good stuff to you and keep bad stuff away? Or what's the story on that? Probably a little of both. I, I like to think I have a good relationship with, with everybody. I mean, we're all people, and, and we butt heads from time to time. We get irritated. Um, I feel like I get more irritated with them than they do with me, but they probably think differently. Um, but, yeah, it's been, it's been fine. I think they've been – every now and then you'll, you'll, you can just tell when they're trying to work an angle. And the great thing about being in the press is that you have the capacity to ignore that. And just try and figure it out yourself. But um, this one's a this one's a hard one, hard one to figure. Um, it, it really is. Uh, when you even when you go back to June six, I could even go back a you know probably a few weeks before that. Um, I was actually playing golf with with Monahan and and Jason Gore, Chris Tootin from Titleist, and uh, Andy Pazder when he was still employed. And right. Played a round of golf, had a few beers when it was over. And I think Jay was probably a week away from signing the deal and you would have had no idea whatsoever what was going on. And neither did the other boys that were playing. That was weird. And then you try and figure yes. out what they could have done differently. And I, I just honestly don't have the answers. Yeah. That whole situation. Well, it's been weird from the get go. Um, I mean, the, the whole thing, um, I, I don't even know how to describe it. You're the, you're the news journalist here. Um, I don't other than I think that that both sides have have kind of made some tactical errors um 
You know, I know the live deal has all been all about the money, bringing money, buying their way in. And then the tour is, I'm not sure what the tour strategy ultimately has been. I know starting out, it was political, which I thought was a huge mistake, but that's just me. I don't know any, I'm just a golfer. I don't know anything. I'm not an expert business person (laughs) like they, like they are. Um, but what's going on now, I still don't fully understand. I get the gist of it. Um, but I mean, I would, I would kind of think Doug, to be honest with you, you know, the players better than, better than the tour staff does really, maybe other than a, the handful of the top guys. I mean, I would think that you would have as good of a kind of a, a pulse, you know, the, the beat of the pulse of the players and have they ever asked you what the majority of the players are thinking, or do they just think that they, you know, I know we have the pack and the board and all that. And I was on all the, I was on the pack for a long time. Um, the system of communication is okay, but it's, it, 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 it never it, be, it's been exposed that it's not great. So yeah, have they never asked you for any kind of like what you're thinking? No, I think they, um, I think they think they have it figured out and I don't think they, they ever will in terms of what the players are thinking. And it, that goes back probably 50 years, Scott, you, you start looking at, at what the tour is and you, and it's always been your top heavy stars, your, your middle of the road, and, and then kind of your guys hanging on for dear life. And they all have different needs and interests and thoughts and, and putting all those together into one is, is nigh impossible. It, it, it really is. And I think we're, we're seeing that now people, you know, at the lower end, worried that the bigger guys are just looking out for themselves. And, I, you know, I don't necessarily blame the tour for having a poor communication system because you cannot please everybody. You have too many different walks of life and, and levels of play. Um, it's not going to happen. I think even in that, I wasn't in, where the heck was that? I guess it was Canada right after the deal was announced. But, you know, you had some of the lower end guys that were complaining about one thing and, and Rory speaks up to play better. And that wasn't the right answer they wanted to hear. And, and, you know, that speaks to the, to the whole issue, frankly, I think the two no, are, and they're, you're a hundred percent right. I mean, they're, you're right. There's, there's so many different levels of guys and, and everybody is, I mean, that's the one thing about golf is, you know, you've been around it enough and, and watched enough and presumably played enough with guys that are in the business. Um, if, if you play golf here, basically it's all about me. You know, and if it's not all about me all the time, then you're not going to be as good as you could be. That's right. So, yeah, I could I could see how that I mean, I know I was like I said, I spent eight or 10 years on the pack and I get it that uh, how hard it is to you can't ever make everybody happy because everybody has a different angle. Um, the but it's just it, the other side to it, too, though, Scott, and I don't know if you ever felt this way I hate to throw everybody under the bus on this, but but I always. I always think that most of these guys only care about playing good golf. Um, What I find interesting about this is this is the first time they've really gotten, you know, we need to know more, you know, I want to get involved. I never felt that way before. Most guys will get upset for about, you know, 30 minutes and then they're back to the range trying to hit balls and figure out how to hit a good fade. I always think back to Carl Peterson, who's one of my absolute favorites. When VJ was suing the tour, over the deer antler spray. And I asked, I asked Carl, I said, what's, what's it like with, you know, VJ's in the locker room and that's the guy who's basically suing you. He's suing the tour. Is that awkward? And Carl said, most of us just care about when our pro-am time is. And if our courtesy car has got a full tank of gas. And I thought, yeah, that's about right. <laughs> Not every- And that is about right. And, and you know what, Doug, that as a player at a tournament, that particular day, that particular week, that's what you better be thinking about. Yeah. Because if you're not, you're going to get run over and you're going to go turn your courtesy car in with just a little bit of gas gone because you're leaving on Friday. I so get, I've gotten, you know, I think we all get a lot of things wrong on this um, when you're trying to figure out what happened and, and where it's going. But the one thing I wrote early that I still stand by is Jay, I don't think ever underestimated um, the threat of the Saudis. I think he overestimated the loyalty of his players. Because I think what we're seeing, by and large, is that everybody just wants more and more and more. Sometimes that means jumping ship and going to live and getting money they don't deserve. Um, but what I'm seeing now that I think is really troubling is that these guys are getting more and more and more perks. Stupid perks. Perks they don't need to be having. Ice baths. Wild-caught sand for player dining. It is, oh, excuse me, the flushable toilets. 
on each nine for their <laughs> spouses. You know, oh, boy. Vivian, Vivian Player, Barbara Nicholas, how did they ever get by all those years without having a flushable toilet while they're out there watching their guy play? It's crazy. I know. It is crazy. I Listen, Doug, it's like... Um, Happy for you, by it, the way, it, if you it, get it. <laughs> <laughs> the flushable toilets? Absolutely. Yeah, I, I get it. Um, Bill, Bill, they're, they're starting to call him... Um, uh, John Aroms, I think the uh, for the portable <laughs> toilets because he wanted more of them before he left. John Aroms, there you go, and then he left. I wonder <laughs> if they have those on the live tour. And I sure I hope bet so. they do. Well, so they, I mean, it, it's just it's like every it, I, it will just keep it in sports, but like every professional sports league, once the money starts getting big enough, I mean, there's more and more people that want their you know a piece of the pie. Um, and golf is not that it's lacked in money because, I mean, you you know, I, I was fortunate enough to make a great living playing golf, um, which sounds kind of stupid in the real world. But but that's what it you know, that's what the sport is. But, yeah, we're kind of moving into, you know, like the baseball or football when they have a strike because the players and it's, I'm not taking either side because the players and the owners can't agree on how much money they should be splitting up and how many perks they get. And, and golf's never had that. Now the massive influx of money, you know, the agents want a piece of it. The, the networks want a piece of it. The players want a piece of it. And it's, it's new territory. Um, and it's been, in my opinion, it's been kind of rocky, but I, I don't have any idea where it's going to end up. Although I think golf will survive. It's just going to be different. Um, and are you going to be able to cover the new golf? Have you been to a live event? Yes. Yes. I was uh, between Pebble and L.A. I, was, I spent a week with my with my mom in the Central Valley of, of California. And it would be my best chance to go. So I went over to Vegas for a day and a half. Uh, ended up hanging out with Tommy Fleetwood, which I didn't really expect. Tommy looked like a, a guy from Star Wars. Yeah, he had a hoodie on with a beard. And it was just like Yoda or right. something. It was great. Yeah. Walked around with him. People are taking his picture. And, and Tommy said, uh, well, at least you're in the picture. I said, yeah, you don't understand. This is bad for me because people are going to see this picture and say, where's your story about Tommy going to live? And <laughs> it's not there. He was just he was just yeah, no. and just wanted to go see for himself like I did just to see what it was like. You know what? It was fine. It was a I guess it was a Thursday because it ended on Saturday. And I was out watching like I would be at, at Riviera. But I think both of us that day, I don't want to put words in Tommy's mouth, but kind of came to the same conclusion that you ask yourself, what's the significance of this? And there is none. To me, it's not a, it's not a real watchable product. I struggle with it a little bit, even though there's great players out there. There's just right. no meaning to winning a Canadian Open, to winning Memorial. It's, it, those are kind of big deals. Well, you, no, there's shot. no... No, you're right. I mean, because golf is is like some like say baseball is so much about the history and the guys that have come before us. Um, you know, the Arnies, the Jacks, the Trevinos, the Watsons. You know, guys that kind of set the standard. And is I'm not totally. I'm not a. I'm I'm pro PGA Tour, obviously, but I, and I'm not totally against live. But but some it's not right yet. Somehow no. there needs to be a compromise in the middle, and it would be my opinion. Um, it's kind and, of and the fans, the fans is who you uh, who you that's who you speak to, um, and the fans are are kind of losing out on this deal. But they but the fans have lost out on all pro sports. You know when when salaries go up, prices go up. You know the prices of tickets go way up. If you put a good enough product out there, people still pay and go see it. So. Part of the problem is the the product's diluted on both sides. So how can you not get together? I mean, that, that to me, that's the ultimate. They've got to get together to keep the game palatable for the fans. And they will will do that as soon as they they figure out peace in the Middle East. I mean, this is this is not going to be an easy <laughs> process. I, I I don't. You know, I think Rory took things a complete opposite direction when he when he kind of suggested there should be no penalty if a guy is eligible, and that got the hackles up of a lot of players, I, I, a lot of them. Um, you know, Spieth had to speak that that week at uh, where were we? It was Pebble, and he was kind of halting in his speech, and it it um, 
you, you figure it out later. The reason that was is that he was biting his lip. I mean, he, he is very strong against these guys just being able to, to just come back without penalty. They did a lot of damage to the tour. They took a lot of money. Should they be able to just come back because that's what the fans want? I get that part of it. And I think, to your point, everyone wants to see that. How do you do it? I have no idea. It's not going to be easy. No, I, I agree. And, and, and Jordan is, is um, you know, there's a lot of moving parts in it, but he's, but he's right to a certain extent that, um, I mean, they injured the product in certain, you know, in different ways, but uh, man, there's got to be a solution that, that is better um, than what's gonna, going on now. And there, there will get, be. I think where it's going to get worse is, is the majors. So your first thought is, this is only going to take the majors and elevate them even greater because the majors are going to be the only time that you get everybody together and their importance were already strong is going to go through the roof. However, what's going to happen in a year or two when, when guys like DJ are no longer exempt for the, for the British or the PGA or DeChambeau is not in the masters. Um, when these little five-year exemptions run out and, right. and now they're not there. Now you've really got a diluted product. Um, I, you know, they, I don't know. I don't know how they're going to sort this out. I think you know one of the one of the possibilities is to, and this is the part that I haven't figured out yet either, because the the live team concept may have some potential. The fifty four hole stuff to me is is boring. Um, that little team thing at the end was actually kind of cool, a different format. Could you have a live type league at the end of the year, in which everybody gets together and and yeah, maybe that works. But all of a sudden, you're asking guys to play 25, 26 times a year. They don't do that. No, you're right. But, you know, that was, you know, that's 100% right. But if you offer enough money, guys might change their mind. That's kind of been the whole, that's been the whole thing. But listen, that Doug, that reminds me of uh, when the FedEx Cup playoffs came out. The very first year, you know, we're at a player meeting at the tour championship and Fincham announces this Tim Fincham, the commissioner at the mm -hmm. time announces this whole new scheme of we're having playoffs and money's going up, blah, 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 blah. And of course I raised my hand and said, uh, Tim, I, since these are playoffs, there's no pro ams in the playoffs. Right. And boy, did you see him crawl at, Oh no, 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 there's pro ams. And I go, there's no pro ams in the playoffs. Come on. Um, but anyway, yes, needed it for the money to make the money bigger in the playoffs. But the very first year, I know you'll remember this, the first year, maybe two years, they scheduled four tournaments in a row. Mm -hmm. You know, the three playoff events and then the tour championship. And after the meeting, I, wanna, I walked up to Tim and I go, Tim, that's not going to work. And he goes, well, what do you mean? And, he go, and I said, guys aren't going to play four tournaments in a row. You know, I said, I can't play that many in a row. Well, why not? And I go, well, I just... I just can't. I go, but when has Tiger Woods and Phil Mickelson played four tournaments in a row? Mm -hmm. um, and it was never. Well, everybody tried it for one year and then immediately started falling apart. And then guys started winning the FedEx Cup playoffs without playing all the playoff events. So, the, you know, there's some live and learn on, on both sides. Um, and I know what you're saying. Uh, if there's 25 events, if they pay enough money, some guys are going to give it a shot. But it probably won't last. No, that's a good point. I always, I, the funniest thing to me was 2009 and, and Tiger showed up at the Barclays, the first one, because it skipped the first year. And he didn't realize that he could win all three of the first events and get to the tour championship and, and still not win the FedEx Cup. But when it dawned on him that he could play all three and still not be guaranteed winning, he was so pissed off that day. <laughs> what am I doing here? Well, yeah, no, I get it. And then the guys figured out, hey, if I just win, I can win the first two and not play anymore and still win the thing. So uh, there's all, there, obviously, there's a lot of ebb and flow. And, and even, in, you know, with the tour stuff, and now they're going to have to make it work with the live stuff somehow. And I always felt like the majors were kind of the, kind of the, to me, they were the answer to this deal. If they would figure out how to get the best players, w whether it's, Monkey in with the world world golf rankings, using a different criteria to get in. Um, like you said, it's hard to keep John Rahm and Brooks Kepka and DJ and those guys out if they continue to play like they play now. Um, it hurts the product. So I kind of felt like the Masters in the in the U.S. Open and the RNA 
in particular could could probably come up with some solutions that would really help everybody. But that remains to be seen. Um, and I have no idea what they're going to do. You would it's, know better than me because you talked to all those people. They they would, I mean, they would always argue you should take the top 10 or the top eight, or I think someone said 12 from Lib, which I think is a little bit high. Uh, for all I know, that could motivate a guy. Uh, and, and that's the one thing I still have a question about is, is how motivated you are when you're fat and rich. Um, I think they're all professionals, <clears throat> but like right now, um, Cam Smith has basically disappeared for two or three weeks. Uh, doesn't mean he won't win the next three for all I know. I'm just saying if you throw that carrot right. out of these top guys are getting into the majors next year, I think I think you might see a little bit more, um, I don't say motivation, maybe inspiration to play well. That's exactly what's gone on with, with Neiman. Not what he's done on live, but just what he did in terms of getting his game sharp and and winning in Australia and, and having a couple other good good tournaments and that got Augusta's attention. Not his live win, but the fact that he's willing to right. go out the box and play well. Yeah, no, there. That, you, I agree, hundred percent. He he went outside the box and went and won the Australian Open. I think it was the Open or the PGA. The Open. It was the, the Open. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, um, Field, by the way, everyone's making a big deal out of the Australian Open. I know it's got great heritage back in the day with Nicholas and Jack and Arnie and, and a bunch of other guys. But if you were to look at who was playing in the Australian Open, you'd be looking at the Rocket Mortgage. Right. Yeah. Was, still- actually, yeah. The field. The field's not as good as the Live event. So. Yeah. That's the problem, and that's for people that apparently are smarter than than me for sure, and maybe you to try to figure out. So but good luck to them. Too- I, I, I'm curious to see how this goes through Bay Hill, because one of the things I don't like about these signature events, which are kind of mirroring live, is... Hang on, Doug. Hang on one second. Can you hear my dogs barking? Absolutely, I can. <laughs> that might help a little bit. Sorry. This is this is the real, real life po- podcast. I mean, <laughs> dogs, <laughs> cats. Yeah, there's <laughs> animals going bit. everywhere, waiting for start- kids to come in. One of the one of the issues I have with with getting excited about live is I'm seeing the same guys week after week after week. It's a close shop of of <clears throat> I don't want to say 54 guys because it's actually only about 20 who look like they're they're worth anything. But we're doing the same thing now. Right. Whether it's Pebble Riv, whether it's Bay Hill next week, we're just seeing the same cast of characters, and I I don't know how that's going. Uh, this needs time, obviously, but but it's got my it's got my attention. Um, to me, the great thing about golf is when you get when you get the guy, there are a lot of good players out there. We just don't know who they are yet. Um, well, you know, I, I like having a full field. I think it brings out way more opportunity. I, we've already seen this kid, Jake Knapp, who's, who's got my attention. Right. I thought what was fascinating, you know, some of Tiger's best duels back in the day were guys most people hadn't heard of. You know, whether it was a... Yeah, no, you're right. yeah Bob May. Bob May put uh, himself on the map of, by... Um, but I remember you, know, you would ha- open, Having a he, great duel. Yeah, yeah. Four guys, and all of them are outside the top 100 on the money list. Then it was a pretty good go. Yeah, you know, you're right because, um, you know, like here, actually, recently Austin Eck wrote, um, you know, a guy that not everybody had heard of, but he's an Oklahoma guy. He actually was on my, he was my second guest on my podcast because I've known him since he was a 17 year old. Um, you know, he just won the. He just won the old Honda Classic Cognizant or whatever, and he was, you know, 101st in the world or whatever, and so not a lot of people had heard of him. But, like, a guy like that, he can play. And it yeah. seemed, like you said, the signature events are kind of cutting some of those people out. And I don't know. I, I, it's all about the money, which is what every pro sport ultimately gets down to is it's all about the money, and golf's in a weird spot that money, you know, how you play has been more important than the money and and – it's just so it's just so mangled up right now. I just you at least you have a you got a ringside seat <laughs> True. to see what's going to happen in this deal. Mangled, you know. Speaking of Austin, um, and, and this is where I think we we we're losing out right now. We we are so driven because of because of live and because of frankly society and social media and everything else. Everything is so star heavy that we just kind of poo-poo anyone who's not a star who's winning. And one of the issues I think going on on tour right now are who are these guys winning? Well, they kind of, I think they're kind of interesting. They may not have great star power now. Um, 
you say no one knows Austin Eckroat, and you're you're probably right. You do, I do, um, and a lot you of know, golf people do. And they, this guy is not he didn't he didn't just come out of the woods. This guy's a proper good player who just needs time. No, to no, and they start to show it. Yeah, and then, yeah, yeah. Like so, the Jake Knapp kid. You said you know I didn't know that much about him, and it took him a, a while, obviously, to find his footing. But yeah, so a young kid like Austin, who's 24 years old. I mean, I played with him when he was 17 years old, and I was like, holy crap, this is what's coming. Um, and and more- sure enough, it, there are. There's more like him. I think Austin's got a chance to be a, you know, a top 10 player in the world, you know, potential superstar. He's got that kind of mentality and that kind of game. But, but there's more of those guys, and there's more of those guys coming, which actually kind of led me up to one thing I wanted to ask you about. Since you're there, there are so many young guys now. Is it like a different – uh, is it a different feel to you versus, you know, kind of the old guys versus all these young guys coming as far as um, the dynamic of, is it that much harder to separate yourself now? Yeah, I think so. Cause there's, there's so many of them. And I think back in the day and I, I cannot believe I'm going to bring this name up, Scotty, but I'm going to do it. Like when a guy like Anthony Kemp, <laughs> when he showed up. Well, he I was, was going to ask you about him, Doug, because he's a, he's a sooner me. just like you, dude. <laughs> You've got to be all over this guy. He's a sooner. Well, I, I would, you know, I first met him at the Sony Open. He was with Bambi, his caddy. And um, he looked at my sister and got Bambi. me this Bambi, there you watch, go. <laughs> a watch that had an OU face on it. And Bambi introduces me to this young kid, Anthony Kim. He looks at my watch and he said, what would you think of the coach at OU? And I thought, man, I don't, I don't know what he's talking about, and I don't want to go there. Anthony was a different breed, but talent wise, I mean, he, he really, he really stood out. And I think the hard thing now is that there's so many, I mean, we could talk about uh, Jake Knapp has got a, just a beautiful little swing going. Uh, Austin, enough said about him. We could talk about Nick Dunlap, the kid from Alabama who just won one in Palm Springs. And we've forgotten already about Ludwig Ober, the Swedish kid who is, he looks like the guy that Rocky fought in Rocky for this guy is a machine. He is so good. Yeah. But that's just four right there. You're right. What about that kid, Tom Kim, who's already won twice, the uh, 20-year-old? That's five. And I probably left five out that that I haven't mentioned. And that's what makes it hard to distinguish about who's going to be your next stud. Is that bad? Yeah. I don't know. You know what? I mean, I I guess, you know, Tiger Woods obviously changed the games in in a multitude of ways. You know, um, yeah, he was really good. Well, and he's kind of responsible for how all these young kids look now. You know, they he got everybody into the working out, looking. You know, there's no more kind of big, big, I won't say fat, but large, soft guys coming out. Dude, they're all, these guys are all chiseled. So um, I'm sure you've noticed that yourself, that you used to be eye to eye with some of these guys. And now it's like, oops, this guy, like you said, this guy looks like he could fight in the Rocky movies. So that's changed a ton as well. Yeah. But it, along it, with that, have the person are the personalities still there from your opinion or in your opinion? No, it's it's not quite as good. And it, it's to be expected, I think. I mean, this is a twenty four seven business. I think part of them too have been trained to watch out for the gotcha moments. I think they're they're probably a little bit more guarded. We we latch on to the ones who um are free speaking and, and um you know. Uh, a little yeah. bit more carefree. I, you know, I hadn't really. That's true in a lot of not just golf. Yeah, no, I I agree. I hadn't really thought of it in those terms of the gotcha moment, but yeah, that's become such a such a thing, and, yeah. and in a lot of ways, a bad thing that it kind of forces some people, or or it makes people uncomfortable with everything. It telling feels the whole like story. What we do now is all about what somebody said, and at the end of the day, who cares what they say? It used to be about how they how they played. I always think back to when, like when Rory about 10 years ago, when he made a full switch over to Nike and Faldo did this big interview saying he thought it was a mistake. And now they got to run back and talk to Rory about what he thought about Faldo's comments. Then you got to go back to Faldo and talk about what he thought about Rory's comments about his comments. And then when do you ever get the paper out? If there is a paper, of course we've covered that area. Yeah. If there was, yeah. Back <laughs> yeah, was, yeah, there's not many papers left. All right. So what, what uh, this is a really tough question here, Doug. What's the best question you think you ever asked a player? Can you even narrow it down? Because you've had 
Doug is actually brilliant for people that may not know. You're, they're going to start paying attention to the newspapers now, Doug. But I'd have to, I'd have Doug to, is the best. If, I was actually thinking about uh, Patrick Canley, of all people. When, when they, he shot 68 one day, uh, I think we were at Liberty National, and he's like tied for fourth in the morning, and then they brought him over. And I mean, I had nothing for him. And I finally said to him, I said, what would you ask you? And he said, I think I wouldn't be very good at your job. And I said, well, it's pretty clear I'm not either. And we just sent him on his way. <laughs> I'm going to talk to Scott That's for pretty good. 30 minutes, and I'm probably going to ask him the same thing. I remember, you know, I'll say this, and it's it's recent, so it's kind of fresh in my mind, but we usually know 80% of the time what the answer is going to be. We just need you to say it. And I was really shocked at, at Rory at, at Pebble when he was talking about the need to have everyone together and it just doesn't feel as important without everyone there. And so I asked him, I said, if you're standing on the 18th at Pebble come Sunday, I uh, didn't know it was going to rain that week. Um, and you're standing there with the trophy with this, would it, would the wind feel cheapened because not everyone was there. And he said, yes. And that was shocking to me. Um, the, the idea that, that a victory at Pebble beach and a, at a signature event isn't as good because DJ and Rom were playing, because the fact is, when Rory had won at Quail Hollow, Dustin wasn't there that way. I mean, not everybody's there except in the majors, obviously. Right. That was kind of a that was kind of a surprise. Yeah, like a, like it's uncharted territory for for damn near everybody in golf, um, and it's a learning experience. I mean, I'm I'm actually uh, I, I've always liked Rory, and I, I thought he was <laughs> you know he he was doing too much the last year or two. I'm glad he kind of you know, took himself out of the equation the best he could. Now, obviously he can't stay out of it because like you said, the talking at Pebble, but I was happy to see him kind of pull himself away from the limelight a little bit because that's not, he's not going to play his best golf if he's stuck in the middle of this controversy. So I'm, I'm glad he did that. I, I don't know if you like that being on the reporting side, cause you may not get as much Rory and he's generally a good quote, but career wise, it was a good move in my opinion. Yeah. I, I, I agree, but the you know the trouble is, and this goes back to to a media that can can lean on the lazy side, if you don't mind me saying, is that every time he shows up, you're going to get asked the same thing. <clears throat> Why do you keep talking about it? Well, because you keep asking about it. I mean, that's just part of the part of the business. I mean, I'm thinking he'd love to have weeks where he doesn't say anything. Unfortunately, he's actually had a few weeks where he wouldn't talk at all because he just got tired of the questions. Yeah, no, I, I, I get it. Um, but it's, you've never asked a question that people got tired of. I can tell you that. And I say that in a, in a proper great way because you do do your homework. Um, and I, I, no, I admire you. I mean, I, you know, I, I was going to bring it up. You won the lifetime achievement award in, for journalism from the PGA of America, which is really that's that's got to be the pinnacle for being a sports writer, at least in golf. Correct? Yeah, that was that was a that was a surprise. It made you feel old, but yeah, <laughs> yeah well, that was it's because you are old. How old are you, you now? Are you older than me? Sixty. How no, are you? 60. Oh, yeah, you got me by just barely. All right, Young. I knew we were pretty close, and knew we were pretty close in age. Maybe that's why we could talk because we're <laughs> similar era. Even though you went to, you have Spanish, yep, which really is amazing to me. <laughs> I can't wait to talk, see you next time and try to talk to you in Spanish. I'm going to order a beer from you. Yeah, but that'll go well, and then you'll say thank you, and we'll be done. <laughs> yeah. Muchas gracias, senor. All right. So you got any other hobbies, Doug? Anything you'd like to do when you're not writing, or you, obviously you're not watching golf all the time in your off weeks? Well, sometimes I, sometimes I kind of have to to pay attention, but... Uh... No, I I, uh, I don't play enough golf anymore. I played with you and your son that time at Kapalua. They won't let us on the course anymore. That's part of the new. Oh, they won't. No, no, they got to keep that only for the uh, players. They're doing a lot for the players right now. I am, I am speaking to you. Here's a here's a scoop for you. I am speaking to you from the media center at Sawgrass. Uh, going to go meet with Chef Liquor in a few minutes, and they they have right. taken away a room that used to be for the digital crowd and have turned that into a special workout place for the players for one week. I mean, they've got a full like gym only for the players for this one week of the year and kicked out some of their 
you know, social media, digital camera people and kick them out down the street. It's just another example of so just how much they're giving to the players. I guess the trailer. So wasn't as we speak, you're actually in a workout facility right now. Is that what you're trying to tell me? I'm down the hallway from it. And no, I'm not going to go work out. Oh, okay. <laughs> I mean, this would be like the player's dream to ask a media guy, have you ever worked out before? Yeah. <laughs> How could you stand in my shoes if you've never been in the gym like I have? Exactly. That's the old, <laughs> that's the, that's the, saw me running that's the old school guy. And uh, he said, was that you yeah. running this morning? And I said, was I going really slow? And he goes, yeah. That's why we don't exercise. Yeah, that <laughs> that was me. Oh, perfect. Well, Doug, um, I think we could talk for hours and hours, but I don't want to keep you. I know you got more important things to do. Um, I really appreciate you coming on because I you're one of the people that I know has the pulse on golf, and you've had it for a long time. And right now, it's really hard to get a pulse on golf. So um, I would encourage people to look up. Yeah, I know, us included, but if anybody's going to do it, it's going to be Doug Ferguson. If his name's on the byline, then at least you know he's done his research and he has talked to the right people. So um, I give you, I give Doug a ton of credit. I give you a ton of credit, Doug, for being the guy that you are um, and handling yourself in the media world the way you do. Because as a, from the other side of the aisle, you're easy to talk to and a lot of guys aren't. A lot of guys are looking to throw you under the bus or you know get a quick hit and uh i think that's why you are where you are doug i know it is from the player side you have respect and admiration and um to me that says as much about you as a reporter as anything so thank you so much for coming Appreciate on that. being a friend if you ever if you come back and go to any ou games or osu games or anything uh let me know and we'll hook up you know if you just want to come back and play golf at oak tree it's so hard now that you'll You'll love it. It's so hard now. It's been hard for 40 years. It has, and now it's really hard. So I was a student. You'd really enjoy it. I signed up as a caddy for the 84 amateur. My guy didn't take it. Oh, perfect. (laughs) No, apparently he didn't. No, he did not. All right, Doug. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much. Uh, I appreciate you coming on. I hope to have you on again sometime when th- when there's more breaking news on what's going to happen yeah. to the world of golf. Oh, great. We'll talk tomorrow then. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> All right. Perfect. All right. Thanks, thanks buddy. Words. Take care, Scott. All right. Thanks for tuning in. If you liked what you're hearing about the game of golf and other things, go to selloutcrowd.com and learn more.